Good morning, Tabernacle family. I pray that you are having a great day. I'm going to let you in on a little secret. I'm actually taping this early, so it's not actually Sunday that I'm taping this. However, I want to share with you a couple of things. First off, as you can see, I'm standing in the hub. We're coming down to the wire here. We've got about four more weeks worth of work, so let's pray things continue to move smoothly so that we can then eventually move in and begin to host some form of in-person worship. Having said that, I know some of you are getting COVID fatigue. I would just tell you, be careful. Cases are starting to climb again. Let us all do our part to remain safe so that we can enjoy not only each other, but that we can make for a safe community for everybody around us. May we be the light that God called us to be and be the leaders as the church. There's much happening right now. I lament so much. We've got two more shootings that have happened, police-related shootings. I'm praying for the Bryan family and the Johnson family. I pray that you pray with them as well. And then right here in this city, these, this last week, we've had um, people with road rage and getting to um, confrontations on the highway. We've had confrontations in homes that have led to shootings. Let's pray that we curb gun violence and let's continue to pray that our government systems on all levels, local, regional, and national, would step forward and do what is necessary to keep everyone safe. Let's do that. Let's, let's be good stewards, and if we see something, let's get somewhere safe and report it to officials so that it can be handled properly. Let's, let's do that. Let's continue to pray. And then I want to share with you along the lines of prayer and it's coming across the screen. In the month of May, we're going to spend time praying. This is 3,000 Prairie I'm standing in and we're going to pray all month long and we're going to invite other people in to pray with us that God would protect and cover our community, that God would continue to give us the resources we need to finish this building and do ministry beyond and that God will continue to build and strengthen us as a church. So here it is. And I give big thanks to Brother Jeremy May who came up with this idea. 3,000 prayers for 3,000 prayers. So we're going to pray. You invite people in to pray. This is real simple. All of us can take time and pray. And let's watch God move as we trust him with our concerns, with our heart and our cares. Let's, let's talk to our God who is huge. Let us not put him in a box. And then lastly, before we move on into worship, which um, shameless plug, I believe you're going to enjoy this morning. Um, we're moving into this message, the conquest, right? And we're talking about chapter eight. And today, um, when this message gets aired, that will be today, I will start with the first part of chapter eight, which deals with the assignment. But there's three parts. There's the assignment, there's the ambush, and the altar. And this is Israel coming back and conquering AI after AI had first conquered them. I just want to say to somebody this morning, as we get ready to go into worship, that you are not the totality of your mistakes or your past sins, that God can forgive when we confess and that God can restore. So to that end, let me pray and then let us enter into worship. Father, we thank you for this time and this day. We thank you for just providing the word for us. We thank you for covering and keeping us. May your word today, may our worship today stir up on something on the inside of us that draws us closer to you. May somebody who watches this, Lord, be drawn to you and confess Jesus as Lord and Savior. And God, may we be shaped more in his image and his likeness. May we radiate him wherever we go. We pray and ask all of this today in Jesus' name. Amen. Listen, take care and I'll see you soon.
God right now on today. Yes. Yes. We want to ask that you stand up on your feet yes. and bless the Lord with us on today. Yes. Amen. 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 Come on, put your hands together like this. Yes. yes. I'm chasing after you. No matter what I have to do, cause I need you more and more. I'm chasing after you, no matter what I have to do, cause I need you more and more. I'm chasing, I'm chasing after you, no matter what I have to do, cause I need I you. Need you. I'm praising. 
Hallelujah. Yes. Good morning. Once again, it's good to be with you on this wonderful Sunday. And we're going to ask right now that squad, go ahead and break out into your room. Again, squad, go ahead and break out into your room. Your info for the Zoom ID is coming across, and I'm sure you can't wait to get there. Our squad leaders can't wait to see you. And as you enter in, let it be a a time that's refreshing, but most of all, may it be a time where you feel rejuvenated and feel like we are helping you meet Jesus at where you are in your life. Squad. And as squad is transitioning, let's get ready. We're going to go into the book of Joshua. I'm going to ask this morning for you to open it to chapter 8. We're going to walk through a couple of different scriptures even in chapter 7, but I want you this morning to focus and turn to chapter 8. Going to give you time to do that. When you get it and you get there, if you would, whether Facebook or YouTube this morning, if you will say amen once you get there again, Joshua chapter 8, starting at verse 1. And as I mentioned um, in our welcome this morning, we're going to break this chapter 8 down. We'll cover some this beautiful Sunday, and then some we'll cover on Tuesday. So shameless plug, come to Bible study. Bring somebody with you. Look, you don't even have to travel. You can set up your favorite snack and get relaxed, and 6.30, you can join us in Zoom for Bible study. So after saying all of that, let's get into this word. Um, this is, again, one of those moments where it's a teaching moment, and let me say this. Thank you to all of you who made the adjustment last Sunday and view worship with us in Zoom. And so because I know everybody couldn't make it into Zoom, then we're going to walk a little bit up around Chapter 7 of Joshua and then move into Chapter 8. Today's theme, 
message title under this series. We're still in this series, The Conquest, now. Um, but the title for this morning is Just Do It. We're going to take a page out of the book of Nike. We're going to give them credit um, and just say and use the slogan, Just Do It. There are certain times in life where God puts us in a position where he's just asking us to just do it. The famous car maker, Henry Ford, who many would argue was revolutionary and transforming not only our country, but really worldwide economy with developing the assembly line and the means to mass produce was known for saying this statement that mistakes are opportunities to begin again. And here's how he defined it, to begin again more intelligently. This morning, we're going to get into walkthrough, not only what we would deem a mistake, but we're going to take it a step further than Henry Ford and deal with the issue of sin. Sin is missing the mark of God. It is falling short of what God's word says. Sin evolves and entails rebellion, transgression, disobedience, words that we don't use on a regular vocabulary in terms of sentencing, and yet are very real and very true and if we're honest with ourselves this morning, a part of our lives. My hope is for all of us that we're growing, that we're striving, that we're maturing, and that we're fleeing from sin. Paul says in 1 Timothy to his young protege, some sin you just have to flee. You have to run away from. You can't even stay in the room with it. And here what we see happen in chapter 7 is... The Israelites are vulnerable because they've experienced victory. As they come to grips with the idea no longer being just a thought, rather the idea coming to fruition because of God being faithful, that they are now starting to conquer the land that was promised to their ancestors. Something about that for them begin to dim their ability to stay focused and devoted. And as a result, sin comes into the camp. First few verses of chapter 7 says that God is angered at all of Israel. We dealt with last Sunday what it means to be angry at all of Israel because one man's sin is impactful to all that are connected to him. That's why when one of us falls, it's as if all of us falls. Therefore, we all must deal with the sin in front of us so that we can be totally, holistically restored and watch God's hand work and redeem and bring about renewal in our lives. The Bible says God was angry. God has the, not only the ability but the right to be angry. His anger doesn't come out of being presumptuous or certain pet peeves or preferences. His anger comes as a result of his attributes of his love for holiness, his hate for sin and evil. And sin had entered the camp. And so the first time that Israel goes out, the spiled land, by the ask of Joshua, they come back rather bold and arrogant, saying they only need a few of their army members and that this place, Ai, the folk were small. These same small folk, according to verse 5 in chapter 7, run 36 men out, kill 36, that is, and run the rest of the Israelites out to the tune of 3,000 of them. Joshua then begins to become at a place where he's becoming undone. He, he, he anguishes, if you will, 
I'm even trying to find the right word to really describe what he did because it's a mixture of things. He was in anguish. He was upset. He was frustrated. He mourned. He tore his clothes, sackcloth, and ashes. He questioned God as, as if it was God's fault. And like any of us, when we lose focus and something fails, we often want to go to the faithful one, which is God, and ask, God, why? And wouldn't things have been better if you would have just left us in this particular place? I love God's response. God says to him in chapter 7, around verse 10, get up. There's sin in the camp. He's letting Joshua know the fact that you failed after I promised you the land, the fact that you failed after I have faithfully given, given you victory over Jericho because of my mighty hand being on you, the fact that you came up short should have alerted you if you were focused to know that it was not me who allowed you to fail, but you failed yourself. I want to talk to somebody who's been placing blame in all the wrong places except the face you see in the mirror. I want to talk to somebody and preach to somebody this morning who's looked at where you've come from and looked at the hand you were dealt. And while the hand may have not have been the greatest, yet still have not taken responsibility for your part in getting to where you are. You need, like Joshua, to have somebody come tell you, get up. I come this morning to tell you, get up. There's sin in the camp. Joshua gets up. God gives him instruction of how to locate. He said, you have to narrow this down. You and I have to be intentional and allow God to illuminate where sin exists in our lives. You and I have to believe that when God illuminates that he is doing it for an intended purpose so that ultimately he will shine brighter in our lives and it does not stop us from reaching where he wants us to be. And so here's where I want to jump in at because what we see here is God moves Joshua to pick out that which had happened, which one person in the camp has sinned. I want to talk to you from... Now, Joshua chapter 8, stay there. If you're not already there, as I asked earlier, it's coming across the screen. Here's chapter 8, verse 1. ESV says, And the Lord said to Joshua, Do not fear and do not be dismayed. Take all the fighting men with you and arise and go up to Ai. God has now in chapter 8 restored. But let's talk about how we got from chapter 8, verse 1, from chapter 7, starting at around verse 19. The first thing we have to see and understand in this chapter 8, as I mentioned in the welcome, it has three parts. It has the assignment. It has the ambush. And then it has the altar. We're going to deal with mainly the assignment this morning. And in the assignment, we see some things that have to happen to embrace what God has called Joshua and the Israelites to do. The first thing we have to see is because God tells him, do not fear and do not be discouraged. God says, do not wallow in the shame of your yesterday when I'm trying to walk you into the powerful present before you. Don't, don't get stuck where you were because of the sin you made where I'm trying to bring you out to the place that I want you to be. It's intentional that God says do not fear and be discouraged because often the response after we fall is to be discouraged and fearful. And so God brings back chapter 1, Joshua, what he said to him here. Do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged because you've been restored. So let's talk about the restoration process in this assignment. It starts with a confession. Here's the confession part. Confession comes in Joshua chapter 7, verse 19. Then Joshua said to Achan, my son, give glory to the Lord God of Israel and give praise to him and tell me now what you have done. Do not hide it 
from me. And Achan answered Joshua, truly, I have sinned against the Lord God of Israel, and this is what I did. When I saw among the spoil a beautiful cloak from Shinar and 200 shekels of silver and a bar of gold weighing 50 shekels, then I coveted them and took them. And see, they are hidden in the earth inside my tent with the silver underneath. Confession. Joshua had to walk into this with Achan because God gave him the instructions of how to do it. Take time, read chapter 7. I won't walk through all of that here. I will simply say that when God gives us the, the ability to find that which is going on, it behooves you and I to follow that path and get to the root cause of what is taking place. Here it is. There's confession. There are some things you and I just can't cover up. We've got to come clean with God about it. Uh, some of us, what weighs us down now is what we hold in when God is trying to get it out. Some of us would find be the ability to sleep and have rest at night if we would just confess. I know confession is not this popular topic, and certainly it's not something that culture that we live in today likes other than to put it on blast so that they can cancel you. But what I love about God is when there is confession to him, God does not seek to cancel. God seeks to restore so that you and I can continue on our calling. Aren't you glad that we serve a God that is a God of not second chances, but another chance. I want to take a few moments, and I just wonder this morning, while we're here together in this virtual space, do I have anybody willing to type in the comments about the fact that you know that you are here not because God is a God of second chances, but you are here because God is a God of another chance? Do I have anybody like Aiken that truthfully, if truth be told, you saw something, you desired something that God didn't have for you, and you took it, and you tried to cover it up, and you've been trying to walk with it, but then when it finally came out what it was, and God got in it and brought you back, now you can say proudly, I am one who is a living witness that God is a God who restores. He confesses. Joshua had to walk through this process with Achan. Then, not only do we see the confession, we see the confronting. Because after confession, we have to confront that which we've confessed. It does us no good to just say what we've committed. We've got to deal with it. I, I know I've got somebody watching. You, you don't mind confessing. But in your mind, you thinking, I'm just going to keep living how I've been living. I, I done put it out there. I done said what I had to say. I done made it known. Okay, God, yeah, this is who I am. This is what I'm on. And so I'm just going to move forward. God seemingly is telling somebody today that you cannot experience true deliverance. Here's a life point. You can't experience deliverance till you deal with what's in front of your destiny. If I could say it another way, i say it like this. You and I can't experience deliverance till we're willing to deal with the obstruction placed in front of our destiny. And that obstruction for many of us is some sin. The writer of Hebrews said, now laying every weight and the sin that so easily besets us or entangles us, depending on the translation. Let us set it aside and run the race. I come to encourage somebody this morning, confess, then confront. Because when we confess and confront, now we can get to verse 1 in chapter 8, because when you confront which cost Aiken and his family his life. And some, we dealt with this on the Zoom, feel that this is harsh, and I get it. But we're thinking according to our humanitarian instincts on the inside of us, not thinking from a spiritual standpoint of an almighty God who has to rid sin. There's certain things that are in our lives. When we confront it, we have to kill it. And like in verse 26, where God instructs, Joshua to build a heap of stones to create a memorial. Some stuff we got to kill and then put a marker there so that we don't go back. I, 
I want to help somebody who keeps running back to the same sin, who keeps running back to the same puddle of stuff, who keeps running back to what is familiar, even though it's certainly not something that keeps you faithful to God. I want to help somebody and call out that you keep running back to mess because that mess and misery seems more comfortable than the mission that God has before you. I want to say to you this morning, you need to put some stones over it, kill it, and rid it out of your life so that God can then move you forward into your life right now so you can just do what he's called you to do. Once we confront uh, after confession, there's confession, confront, and now check this out. There's calling. Verse 8. Verse 1, rather, I'm sorry, chapter 8. I'm going to say it to you again. Believe it or not, I'm almost out of your way because I want to leave some room and some time, and you'll see what we're going to do. But here it is again, verses 1 and 2, ESV. And the Lord said to Joshua, do not fear and do not be dismayed. Take all the fighting men with you and arise. Go up to Ai. Here's the key word, see. I have given into your hand the king of Ai and his people, his city and his land, and you shall do to Ai and its king as you did to Jericho and its king, only its spoil and its livestock you shall take as plunder for yourselves, lay in ambush against the city behind it. There's calling that's waiting ahead for you and I after we are willing to confess that sin, that rebellion, that transgression. There's confrontation. We have to confront it. But then there's calling. Look at this in the assignment. There's calling. God says, see. That word see is a command. It's not optional. God is trying to alert Joshua to the fact, get up off your face, come out of the dirt. You have been redeemed. I want to help somebody who's been walking with years of shame, weeks of guilt, nights of tears, when God has already forgiven you. Don't waste another breath, another moment, pondering, contemplating what you could have redone. God has forgiven you for that. Let it be forgiven and remember that he's faithful. And when he forgives, he casts it into the sea of forgetfulness. He cast it as far as the east is from the west. You have been freed. Now see. See what God wants to do. Catch this. He says, see, I've given, given past tense, meaning in God's mind, it's already done. Can I tell you that there's some things that God wants to do on the other side of once we've been redeemed and restored and renewed that he's already done? He's waiting for us to catch up to where he is. Let me say that again. God is waiting for us to catch up to where he is and what he's already done. He says, see. Joshua, you got to see this. I've already given it to you. Only what I've given to you, I'm giving it to you in a different kind of way. Jericho, you marched. You marched around. But this time, you, you, you're going to just lay and sit and wait. And when I tell you, you, you you're going to rise up. Please catch this life point, the last one I got for you this morning. Catch this. Just because God moved one way in the past doesn't require him to move the same way in the present. God can move any way he wants to move and he can do anything he wants to do when he gets ready to do it because he's God. Don't box him in because he did it this way last time that he automatically will do it the same way. He says, Joshua, see, I've given it to you. But here's the part I want to catch and leave time and room for. And it's the perfect setup and intro when we'll finish this in Bible study. Here's what I want you to catch. He says, lay. It's going to be an ambush, but you've got to lay down. You've got to get prostrate. You've got to get in a place. I'm going to set it up so that you can't do anything but trust me. I want to look at you very directly this morning. No holler, no, no hoop, no, no noise, no anything. I just want to look straight at you and tell you. There's certain things you and I are not going to hear, certain things are not going to come till we get in position where the only thing we can do is trust God. So here's what I want to do, because I got a sense that as I'm looking at you, that there's somebody who's watching this this morning, who's out of position, who's out of place, 
who's not in that place, you're still trusting in you. You're still trusting in your abilities, your strategy. You're trusting in your degrees. You're trusting in your network. You're trusting in your finance. You're trusting in family. You're trusting in friends. You're trusting in spouses without really having your ultimate trust first in God. So I want to pray because I'm, I believe that on the other side of this, on the other side of the rebellion, on the other side of the sin that God has snatched you out of and snatched me out of, there's a destiny that lies ahead when we can get in a place of total trust. So I want to pray this morning for us and cue this up to talk about the assignment and the altar and Bible study. But I want to pray now. Pray that someone allow God to get them in that place of trust. That somebody don't miss their assignment this morning. Because they're shackled with the past when God has taken the shackles off. Would you pray with me? Father, we thank you and we honor you today. There is no one like you. We pray now, God, that you would help us to face that which is in front of us and to trust that on the other side of it, as you've renewed and restored and forgiven us, that we too can rise and walk in that what you've already set aside. Lord, help us to see what you see this morning. Sometimes we're so busy looking at the circumstances of life, so busy looking at the challenges of life, the obstacles, the task list. May we pause for a moment and just see and see, most importantly, what you see, see what you've given us already. And then, Lord, may we trust you to walk us into it. I know it may be unorthodox. It may be uncomfortable. It may be a scenario that's unfamiliar, but Lord, Praying that you would increase our faith to trust you no matter what we see physically to know that spiritually our faith in you is the substance and the evidence and the proof that we need. So today, Lord, if somebody's watching, may, may they let go of yesterday because you have and may they walk in today. May somebody, Lord, who, who's been ridden and hurting and burdened for a long time understand that you can renew and restore and that they too don't have to be fearful and they don't have to be dismayed or discouraged, but they can rise because Jesus got up, we can get up and we celebrate that today. So Lord, help us to walk and live this truth. We ask this all in Jesus' name. Let us all say together, amen. God bless you this morning, beloved. I look forward to seeing you in Tab Cafe. And if I don't see you there, I look forward to seeing you Tuesday as we continue in this chapter eight under this theme, Just Do It.